You are listening to Up Talk with Sean Conahan. The gloves are off, and it's time to have a chat. Hello, people. Thanks for joining me for episode 19 of Up Talk Podcast. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to have a listen. It's been a while. It's been too long since uh, between episodes. I'll get into that a little bit more in a little in a couple minutes. So I apologize for that. Of course, brought to you by our awesome sponsors, Life Shield Medical and First Aid Training out of Halifax. Also, the Compass Rose Health and Wellness Center in Bedford, Nova Scotia, and Dan Sun Photography. Thank you to them for supporting the podcast, as always. And our title sponsor for this year is Project Trauma Support. I was blessed enough to be able to take part in Project Trauma Support, and for me, it changed everything. Uh, it really did. I know everybody's different. Different things work for different people, but for me, this was awesome. Uh, really showed me how to take care and how to heal my moral injuries that I that come about with with this PTSD diagnosis. Sometimes it's not enough just to refile the memories to where they should have been in the first place. After that, like if you're like me, I was left with a lot of guilt and anger and bitterness, a lot of negative feelings that I had no idea how to process or how to take care of. That's what Project Trauma Support fixed for me. So if you're in that same spot or think they may be able to help, look them up, Project Trauma Support, and get a hold of Manuela Joanu, and uh, she will take care of you. I can promise you that. All right. Again, I want to touch base on the fact that it's been a little bit too long between episodes. Um, I've been struggling a lot over the last couple months with really wild mood swings uh, and really some pretty serious bouts of depression. And it's, you know, it sucked. It has sucked. Uh, I think I'm getting to the end of it now, but, you know, it's one thing when when you're depressed and don't know it. That's one thing. But when you're depressed and because you've learned all this stuff by doing this podcast, you know you're depressed and you know the things that you should do to try to get out of it and you think back to some things your guests said that what might what might have helped them and you use that to try to pull yourself out it's very empowering and this it's exactly why I do this show you know it it's really helped me get out of it and just keep moving forward keep moving forward keep moving forward and don't stop and that's what I've done but you know it's been tough it's been a tough couple months and I'm hoping I'm seeing the end so that's what I've been doing and dealing with for the last little while before we get into this awesome episode of the podcast I also need to tell you about a very special event going on in January of 2018 Paramedic Nat's second annual evening for mental health will be held January 27th at the Tangle Creek Golf and Country Club in Barrie, Ontario Awesome special guest, Sean McCann, formerly a Great Big C. He'll be the entertainment for the evening by sharing his music and his own personal story of recovery from addiction. So that's going to be really special. Awesome night. Money raised will go to the Royal Victoria Hospital Foundation for Youth Mental Health and the campaign I've Got Your Back 911. Tickets are $55 and can be purchased, purchased on Eventbrite. So look them up. I think now they also have a Facebook page for it, so you can look it up that way. Paramedic Nat's second annual evening for mental health. Get there if you can. I'm sure it's going to be great. As always for these episodes, uh, trigger warning. This conversation that you're going to hear next uh, was pretty hard. It was it dealt with some hard topics, and it was pretty emotional. So if you are a person who has has triggers and some things bother you like that, Take some time beforehand and get yourself in a good headspace before you listen because you are going to hear some upsetting things. But I think in the end it's, it's helpful to learn uh, that, again, we are all not alone at all. My guest this week is Peter Tripp. I've known Pete 
for many, many, many years working in Nova Scotia as a paramedic. Great friend, and now he's coming out as a mental health advocate, starting to tell his story of struggle and how he got to where he is today. This was a hard one. This was a very, really hard one to do. It bothered me afterward, just brought up a lot of stuff, triggered a lot of stuff for me. But also that is what ignites growth, so that's all good. But it was uh, it was great. It was a great talk. I loved it. I know you're going to enjoy it. Let's get right to it. My brother, Peter Tripp, welcome to Up Talk Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, bud. Oh, it's awesome. I'm excited to do it. Uh, we go way back, further than we both care to admit, probably. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm so excited to have you on. It's going to be awesome. Um, thank you for taking the time. Well, first of all, let me say I've been following you uh, and your work, and I'm a huge fan. Well, I love you. what you're doing. I love you as a person, uh, and I don't say that uh, very often. Hmm. And uh, and I have mad much respect for you, my friend. Oh. Well, thank you for those words. It's uh, it's my pleasure. I'm I'm struggling like everybody else and just trying to make sense of it. Like <laughs> for sure, know? absolutely. And that's just the way it is. That's the way it goes. Peter, for people that don't know you, like I know you, or I I don't know much about you before EMS. Just uh, give us your origin story. How did you grow up and get involved with uh, you know be interested in EMS? Uh, interesting question. I didn't. Uh, I grew up in uh, actually in Mulgrave Park in Halifax. Oh wow! And then. Yeah, and then public housing uh, back around the well area. And for those of you that have worked these streets, uh, and I mean in an EMS capacity or in a policing capacity, will know the well very well. Yeah, uh, it was a big drug trafficking area. And, That's a tough uh, spot. Mulgrave Park is a tough spot. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, and I was a, a fat kid, and I'm still <laughs> rather chubby. So me too, brother. Me too. Um, I know it well. I was uh, I was picked on quite a bit growing up and beaten around a little bit and bullied and whatever and you know that was fine and and then there came some some uh, child abuse uh, I was beaten and thrown into walls and never really had a an idea of what I wanted to do or be in life so I went to some crime ran some drugs I uh, didn't ever do any drugs really? and I'm proud to say that yeah didn't ever put an illegal drug in my body which uh, I'm very proud to say to this day I haven't done. Although some people have said, you know, it's the way to go with PTSD. You know, for some it does, and yeah, for some you have it to doesn't. get there on your own you know? time. You know, everybody's absolutely. Different. That's right. Yeah. yeah, you know, and taking the shit kickings, and um, you know, doing a lot of the the nasty stuff that I did as a kid. Um, I, I tried to, as I grew up, to be a teenager, and found out that shit. If I don't stop this fucking shit, I'm gonna be in jail, hmm. and, or dead. You remember that? Do you remember that moment? Oh, oh, dude, I remember that like it was yesterday. It really? was just, it was either I do this or I don't. And I just said, I, I, I can't do that. Because I was watching a lot of my friends be strung out, be not who they are. As we all get older, they were turning into these people that I never grew up with, hmm. people who didn't even know their names. You know, and I'm not going to mention names. They know who they are. And, and you know, the odd thing is that weed and hash were the toughest meds back then. Right. Right. They were the toughest street drugs. So they weren't that bad when I no. look at what's out there now. Right. No, when you think about not. it. Absolutely not. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and as I got older, old enough to stop being beaten, I said enough is enough. And, and, and I moved out with my dad and, and we had a good, you know, a good life together. And it wasn't until I was, I got into paramedicine because I had a son, my first son, Ryan. I have three now. Mm. I have Ryan, who's uh, the oldest, Jeremy, who's the second youngest, and then Jake is my stepson, who's my youngest. Right. Uh, but he's not really my stepson. He's one of my three sons. Absolutely. And when Ryan was 18 months old, he had a febrile seizure. And for those of you that don't know, this happens in about 70% of the children out there between the ages, uh, usually from 18 months to two and a half years of age. Parents don't usually know they have it. Sean, man, this scared the fuck out of me. 
Mm. I was trying to jam my finger down the side of his throat mm. yeah. and through his teeth to pull his tongue forward because I thought he was choking. Yeah. And when those medics came to pick him up that day, I said, this is what I have to do. I don't ever want to be prepared again for something that, ha- that my kids throw at me that I'm not going to be prepared for. Right. But, but I'm not very smart. <laughs> this is what I'm thinking. Like seriously, right? How can I, how can I do that as a profession? Yeah. But I'm not smart. I, I, grade nine is the highest I got in school, Sean. So what am I going to really? do? Here I am, here I am a janitor working at the old Halifax infirmary. Wow. And so how am I going to do this? How am I going to help my kids be safe? Yeah. What the fuck? How, how am I, I'm not going to be able to, I'm too stupid. Like, honestly, I did, I don't, and to this day, sometimes it's hard for me. Yeah. But before I started to get into this position, I did not, I could not tell you the provinces of Canada beyond Ontario. Hmm. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and so being Hmm. a janitor, I said, how am I going to get this? Well, lo and behold, the old Halifax Infirmary offered free courses to those employees who were full time. Wow. Okay. And back then, Sean, it was like I was getting paid, you know, fourteen bucks an hour, fifteen bucks an hour for mopping floors. That's a clean that's toilet. a lot of money back then. It is, right? This is around ninety two, yeah. ninety three. Yeah. So anyway, I went through a bunch of these courses and it wasn't until I met two amazing physicians at the old HI. One of them is Dr. Gord Watley. He's an anesthetist, or some people call him an uh, you know, anesthesiologist. Right. The other is Ward Patrick, who is uh, an internist. Dr. Watley took me while I was working in the ICU as a janitor. So many days a week, he took me up in his office, and we went over ACLS scenarios. Really? And first aid scenarios. This uh, uh, we're we're talking an anesthetist, a physician who is an intensivist, who I think is God, right, yeah. as a cleaner. He gets me up to snuff. I become a first aid instructor, a CPR instructor, O2 administration instructor, AED instructor, all of these things through them. Then he says, go volunteer with the Red Cross. So I went with Red Cross. I became an instructor, monitor, trainer, did a whole bunch of stuff with Red Cross. Right. And then it came the opportunity. He said, why don't you go further? And here's what I want you to do. I want you to take an ACLS course. And I'm like, what's that? (laughs) He's like, this is what it is, and you're going to do it. I'm like, Doc, I'm not very smart. But medicine did something to me that nothing ever had. It piqued my interest. Right. So much so that we had a patient one time in the ICU, Sean, that had such an open wound in his body that had to heal from the inside out that it was dressed with sterile pillowcases. Whoa. And he brought me in to that case to change that dressing one day. And I was in awe and I was gowned up, had everything on, the mask on. And he said, what's the matter? You look like you're crying. I said, no, I'm smiling. Huh. So he tutored me. And I remember some nurses saying, if that dumbass janitor is taking our fucking ACLS course, I'm not doing it. Really? And he got it. Yeah. Because I'm not as equal to them, right? Wow. He got wind of it. And he said, if you don't take this course, or you don't think Peter can take this course, then you're out of the ICU. Wow. So then an Emerge doctor, and I'm sure you'll know the name, Dr. Maxwell, and I don't mind yeah. saying that. Yeah. He gets me in this ACLS course, and he starts throwing shit at me like, Here's a PSVT with unifocal PVCs and all of this stuff. And again, I'm a janitor, <laughs> you know, and I did this training with Dr. Watley. So he's trying to embarrass me in front of these nurses. But these nurses I've worked with liked me. And one of the nurses says, oh, don't worry, Pete, we'll put an IV in here. The doc says, well, he's got no arms. All right, well, we'll put a femoral line in, no problem. Well, he's got no legs. <laughs> like He was just playing that. And then at lunchtime, Dr. Watley was around to check on things. And one of his nurses went out to tell him. And Dr. Maxwell apologized to me. Needless to say, I passed the course. 
Yeah. Because, and then it came time to apply for paramedic school. Except the, when I applied to, uh, the VG one, uh, I had everything all set, man. I was so excited. Like I've never been this excited in my life. And I got, I got paperwork. I did my GED a while back and I yeah. thought, this is good. I got this and I'll be staying in Halifax and I can do this. And I get up there and the registrar don't know her name. She says, uh, you got your grade 12? And I said, well, I have my GED. He said, no, that won't cut it. Huh. said, what do you mean it won't cut it? I have my check, like here for the, you know, like a deposit. She said, no, don't even bother giving, me check, giving your check to me because you're not going to get in. And I was devastated. Yeah. So I cried my <laughs> my ass off. And bald and bald and bald and went home to my, uh, my ex-wife now, my wife at the time. And I told her, I told my brother, uh, he's now a psych prop at Queens. I said, that's it. I'm done. They said, no, I'm not smart enough. And my wife at the time said, there's got to be another school. There's got to be another school. And to his credit, Brent Nicholson. Hmm. Uh, I know Brent well. Was, yeah, Brent was at, um, the VG running that program or one of the heads of that program and, he didn't know that I had went in, and he had known me from doing some Red Cross stuff. Right. And had he known that I applied and she had said that, he would have gotten me in. Yeah. But life throws you curveballs, man, and throws you – like I was devastated. I was I, I was afraid to show my face around to anybody that knew how excited I was about going from being a janitor to maybe being a paramedic. Right. Right, because that was a dream. Anyway, I applied to Holland College. They said, well, you know, we might be able to get you in as a mature student, but you're going to need some references. And so right. I'm talking to Dr. Gord Watley. What does he do? He writes a letter. I'm talking to Ward Patrick. What does he do? He writes a letter. They both write a letter for Holland College. And Holland College says, hell yeah, we'll take you. And that's how I started my paramedic career. That's amazing. I didn't. It, uh, I didn't. I didn't know that, Peter. I didn't know that at all. Huh? It's uh, sorry. That's, no, it. I'm barely holding it together myself. The, yeah. I never knew that about you. I never knew about yeah. your, your how you grew up. Yeah. Nobody and, does. That I is. Kept it. Uh, that is amazing. You are an inspirational dude. Thanks, uh, man. No, uh, thank you. That's, um, my, hmm. you know, my first exposure to trauma was being beaten. So how do you, how do you accept that? How do you process that? How do you get beyond that back then in the seventies, the eighties? You don't. Yeah. You suck it up and live with it. Yeah. Wow. So, okay. So you went, you got to Holland College, you got through Holland yep. College. And then yep. when did you start uh, working on the trucks here? Or did, uh, did, you, did, did you start here in Nova Scotia? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. I, what I did when I graduated in 1999, yeah. Mark Wheatley and Glenn uh, back were my preceptors. Yeah, yeah. Man, they put me through the ringer. And, of course, they called me Pikachu because I was short and fat oh, and happy. Oh, I remember right? that. You remember that? And, but I haven't heard that in every, years. <laughs> Yeah, man. Yep. Yes. And they would say, "Hey, this is our this is our student Pikachu," and Pokemon was huge back then with the kids, and everybody was sucking it up, right? So it was kind of cool. Well, I mean, because back then, when when you started, I was in Cole Harbor with Keith Vino, probably. <laughs> yep. And, yep. You, know, you were and Keith, and we were of course always around with Rob and and John, right? Yes. Yep. So, and I I, I remember them. <laughs> I remember them calling you that. Yep. Huh. Sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, no, it's it's crazy. And um so I as I was working on the trucks, both Glenn and Mark said I was uh, I was ready. Ready. Hmm. But I wasn't gonna get anything but casual. They said I was good at what I did. Just it just everything they told me just kinda clicked. Yeah. Although one day I knocked on a door of this, you know, kind of possible 
dangerous situation and Wheatley grabbed me by the scruff of my neck and pulled me, don't ever knock on the fucking door while, while you're standing in front of it. I'm like, go! Oh. <laughs> you know, they were tough on me, but they popped me so much. Yeah. Right? So I got a job at the queue in triage. Right. I was full-time triage, and I still can't believe the people that do that full-time, they don't get enough credit. They do. I did it for two and a half years, two days, two nights, four off. Yeah. The, the number of patients we were seeing back then, you know, Sean. Oh, yeah. The, the, the number of patients was sick. But anyway, it taught me how to hone my skill as somebody who's assessing patients, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, I always and, looked up, and, I always looked up to the medics that were working in triage when I'd come in because I, just because they seemed really on their skills because they were doing it so much throughout the day, I'm sure. But I really looked up to a lot of you guys when I'd go in there. Really did. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. You ask, you ask any paramedic that when they come out of school as a level one PCP, hmm. now this is a while back, how, how good at, were they at assessing an abdomen? Or an abdominal complaint. Yeah. And I bet you 95 will say, not good at all. Yeah. But working at that hospital taught you so many different things about just the abdomen alone. But that's a topic for another night. <laughs> yeah. So, I so I worked, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I worked there, uh, and did that and then transitioned into the trucks full time mm. after about two and a half years. And was that now, was work, that with EMC or was that on the truck, uh, at the queue? That was with the MC. Okay. And I would do the odd PTU shift. Right. And as a casual, uh, my first bit of heavy trauma, something that really bothered me was working the night that John died. Mm-hmm. God rest his soul. Yeah. Um, and being in a truck with somebody, and I'm not going to throw them under the bus. I don't think that's the right thing to do right here. Mm-hmm. And hearing the description of the events that night and hearing... And I, uh, I want to be careful here, Sean, mm. but I want to be real. Yeah. Um, and, and please forgive me to, uh, you know, to Joe's Boudreaux, who was working that night with John. Yeah. And as that tree hit the ambulance, we heard his cries on that radio. Yeah. That my partner's well. dying, you know, and yeah, exactly. And, you're sitting in an ambulance and you can't do anything. You're fucking frozen. Mm-hmm. This is my, I'm a casual here, man. I haven't seen or done any of this shit in my life. Yeah. And I'm getting bombarded and then it's happening. It's happening. It's happening. And then this guy takes me right to a fucking base and says, go in there, sit down, shut up and don't talk to me. Mm-hmm. So I'm sent in a base in the dark. Yeah. To hear this shit on a radio yeah. and to hear that a guy has just died. Yeah, I don't remember any other radio transmissions from my career except for that one. I'll always remember that. Um, yeah, it was haunting. It still is haunting. Absolutely. Hmm. It's, it is, and to find out, you know, that he perished and, and, and it was horrifying. And we didn't get debriefed for, Three to six months. Nobody knew what a debriefing was, it seemed. Yeah, that's right. Nobody knew what to do. We were all fucked. Yeah. How many guys went off on mental or just sick time and not understanding what the hell was going on? Yeah. And that's when it really started for me. Hmm. Right? Then, boom, comes the winter. What happens? I'm working with Carrie Fletcher. Where do we go? John Wiley's house. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that you responded there. Yep. Yeah. Fletch is driving like a maniac. Yeah. We yeah. go there. I'm sh- right now, Sean. I'm shaking. Hmm. I'm. I'm. If for you those of for right everybody now, listening, uh, John Wiley was. Uh, medic, long time, long, long time medic in the, yeah, in the yeah. Halifax area and, uh, and he, he was murdered in his house. Is that, that's what happened? Is that? Absolutely. That, yeah. That's my recollection, yeah. right? And yeah, yeah, I remember that day well. I was working at Calm, but I didn't remember that you guys were the ones responding. Yeah. We, um, he, we got there, uh, Fletch and I, 
I'm first in the house with my bags. And there's a woman with a knife in her hand. And I'm like, what the? F-? And I'm frozen. <laughs> Fletch is right behind me. Yeah. And uh, he said, it's okay. It's his wife. They didn't have any big scissors. They were trying to cut his clothes off. So yeah. dispatch was saying, just try and get his clothes off. Right. And they were trying to use a knife to like to saw through his sweater. Huh. And he was beaten and stabbed and beaten and stabbed. And it was the most graphic, horrific thing that I've ever seen in my life. I'm talking movie shit. I'm talking yeah. anything. I still see his face and his eyes were open and he was agonal respirations hmm. staring right at me. And I'm saying, we're here, John. We're going to do everything we can, buddy. We got you. We got you. And then uh, uh, Daryl showed up after that, uh, tubed yeah. him. Yeah. We, we were putting defib pads on his wounds. Hmm. That's how big the knife wounds were. Right. And anyway, he... Um, as we know, he uh, he passed, and again, you know, however, flip a switch, that night, Mr. Bardwa was an amazing professional, and he took us, even though Fletch and I wanted to keep on going, he took us to Cole Harbor Station, took us out of service, and we sat around for four and a half hours and talked about it. Wow. And it did not affect me, and it doesn't affect me today like John Rossiter did. Because you had that opportunity. Yes, because we debriefed that night and we discussed it and we cried and we swore and we went through the wide range of emotions to try and piece together. What the fuck? Are, are you kidding me? We know this guy. Yeah. It's not supposed to happen in our world, man. We're here to help people who we don't know. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. 90% of the people we reach out to and touch are the ones we don't know. Hmm. And every now and again, we come across some that we do know, yeah. right? Yeah. Hmm. So, and then it just took off from there, buddy. I went to, uh, thanks to Brent Nicholson again. Um, he was uh, instrumental on uh, getting me into ACP program at Holland College. I was diagnosed during that course. I was diagnosed with adult ADHD. Okay. And was put on meds because I was the first to finish exams, the first to get everything done. He would go back and review my exams and there'd be like a page not done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I skipped over questions. Right. And I look back and I go, no wonder I wasn't any good in school. Yeah. <laughs> I had ADHD. Huh. And all I was told is that you're, you're, you're too fat and you're too lazy. That's why you're not doing good. Hmm. Whereas today, if any hint of that, and you would have been put up, put right on medication. Totally. Either that or some kind of CBT, right? Right. Cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. To see how far, get appropriate testing uh, to see if medication is the way to go. If it isn't, then we look at other things, right? We look at continuous cognitive behavioral therapy or an educational, uh, an individualized educational assessment plan for you. Right. You know, but... No, you're just fat, you're lazy, that's it, you'll do, you know, that's your problem. Hmm. So how do you think, uh, I mean, at that point in time, so after John Wiley and continuing with your career, I mean, looking back now, do you notice anything or do you see any red flags? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I Part of the problem is not feeling like you can speak to your peers. Hmm. Or watching the senior guys laugh about something that's horrific. Right. Um, and becoming a dickhead <laughs> of a father. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Not having the patience to deal with a child who's being a child. Right. Not having the desire to get up out of bed. Not, not once, not ever. If I can recall, have I ever thought that I wanted to take my life for some reason? I don't know. Maybe because my brother's a psychologist. Yeah. Although he's kind of left me to, to, to go down my own path. He hasn't been a guy that has said, all right, I'm going to in, intrude here. This yeah. is what you can't do. 
He's let me be my own man, which I, I'll thank him till the day I die for that. Hmm. Yes, you know, the attitude, mood swings, all of these things. Um, but you don't really, you just think it's the job, Sean. You just think it's because I'm working days, I'm working yeah. nights. And, and everybody else is so, a dick, not you. Yeah. Everybody no, totally. else is a dick. Yeah. Totally, yeah. man. Hmm. You don't realize, and then after a while, you're taking medications to sleep in the daytime right. so that you can be up and stoked for night. Yeah. And then the medications get compounded, you start taking more and more. And I don't mean silly meds. I mean like melatonin and like NyQuil and yeah. Gravol, just things to try and get you to sleep yeah. when your circadian rhythm is all fucked up from 15 years of doing this shit. Right. Right. Now, did you uh, did you get a diagnosis of PTSD? Uh, I did, uh, believe it or not, uh, two years ago. Okay, and how that how that come about? See, it's funny. <laughs> um, my present wife now, who is my uh, my best friend, hmm. <laughs> she's a trooper. She puts up with you, so she must be awesome. Oh, dude. <laughs> I, I've said this many times to, to <laughs> my children. How you've put up with me uh, is beyond me. Yeah. But she is my rock. She's, um, you know, they say in order to have a good relationship, you got to have a good foundation. Hmm. And she is it. She's an anchor. She grounds me. She calls me out on shit that someone might yeah. just walk away on. That's the big thing. Uh, she's a, we need someone who will kick our ass once in a she's while. She's a nurse, right? Yeah. She's a nurse that says, uh, no, I don't think so, Dick. Like, <laughs> smarten up, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, in, in other terms, but I get the point. Yeah. And I get that message, right? Hmm. Um, and I forget what you asked me. That's okay. So then, so two years ago, that led up to two years ago. Did you notice things get really, really bad? Is that why you looked into yeah. uh, getting a yeah, doctor? Was- so what was going on? I, working, well now, as you know, I'm a flight paramedic up in northern Manitoba. Right. How long have you been doing that? Uh, a little over two years. Okay. I worked up in Fort Mac for uh, a few years. Yeah, because you and, left uh, more than, you, you left a number of years ago. Not not left, but yeah. left the MC. Yeah. 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 And, and when I did, I took 11 people with me. And apparently oh, I'm not allowed to. Oh, you were part to. of that. <laughs> I remember this I took, now. Yes. I took 11 people with me to yeah. give them a better life. You were the part of the mass exodus. That's right. I was the the second or third person to leave, but I brought everybody with me. I remember that well. Man, management was right? pissed. And they were pissed off. Yeah, and I'm not allowed. It's said that I'm not allowed to go on EMC property. Still? Yeah. I don't think I yeah. am either. So I'm Man of sure. property. And that's okay. Uh, you know, I don't care. Yeah. Um I remember that uh, but well. I've made <laughs> yeah. I've 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 I think I've allowed at least six of those people to have better lives for that. Right. And they've thanked me on multiple occasions and that's okay with me. I'm okay with that. Hmm. So now I'm I didn't really get there was no trauma, no sick, nothing really kind of activating any kind of my PSD, PTSD symptoms while I was in Alberta. Right. When I started working in northern Manitoba, uh, I've seen more PEDS patients in the last two years than I have in my entire career on the streets. Yeah. Some of the sickest, horrific children cases that I've seen and even read. Mm. And we're talking rapes. Uh, we're talking under 10 years of old, 10 years of age, kids being raped. Mm. We're talking um, abuse, neglect, like you've never seen before, like a third world country. And it's t- there's nobody to blame here. While well, there is, but I'm not in the blame game, yeah. and I'm not going to do that. Suffice it to say, 9.9 times out of 10, it's not the parent. Hmm. However, you're dealing with these children, and it just it just destroyed me. Uh, and so I came home from a tour. Actually, I called Lori one time and I said, uh, I'm not sure I can do this, babe. I'm not sure I can do this anymore. And we talked and I bawled. Hmm. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating. I was just kind of like a robot. Uh, you know, a, like flat affect, just uh, non-emotional. And uh, so I came home and I 
actually text my brother and I said, look, um, I need to see somebody about PTSD. And I'm, and Sean, uh, I want to be careful here. First, let me preface it by saying I love Temaconter. I love what they're doing. Yeah. I think the foundation is phenomenal. Their work is undaunting. I, uh, I met Howard, I believe his name yeah, is. Howard, yeah. When I was doing medical for the World Indoor Lacrosse Championships many, many years oh, ago. Okay. And I loved his story and I loved everything about it and I still do. Yeah. When I called Tema to get some help here in Kingston, Ontario, they have no contacts here. Nobody that you can reference for PTSD through Tema. Hmm. And that almost broke me. Right. Because I thought if there's, if there's an agency that has it, right. they do. Right. But they're not quite national in all of the smaller cities yet, and I get that. Yeah, well, that, that must have been in their, in their infant, not really in their infancy, but they were just sort of getting off. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And, and that's cool. And I, and so what I did was I got my brother to reach out to his resources, and um, I get on with the lady up here, uh, and she's phenomenal. And what I did, so many sessions with her, with her, and she wanted to get me into some EMDR training. Yes. Okay. Uh, however, because I work two weeks on, two weeks off, and my children will call me a bitch um, because I can't do spinny things. Oh, okay. Right? Like, I can't do fair rides. I can't go around in a circle. Right. If I'm watching a football game and the camera pans around in a circle, I'm done. Okay. I'll get busy, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. So I couldn't do that. So she suggested I do neurofeedback therapy. I haven't heard about this. And I'm going to tell you something, my friend. This is the cat's ass. Really? Neurofeedback therapy is, first of all, you go, you got to get, you go see a psychiatrist if you're on any medications whatsoever. And the other thing that I want to kind of skip back if I can, yeah. not to jump all over the place, but... That's right, man. Um, it's your show. Yeah. You go. <laughs> the other thing I was diagnosed with was low testosterone. Me too. Which, you know, made me be mm-hmm. kind of uh, no sex drive. Uh, like yeah. Wanting to be with my beautiful, sexy, adorable, loving, caring wife who I would die tomorrow for. No word of a lie. Mm-hmm. If there was a choice of her life or mine, you sorry, I'm gone. See you yeah. later. Yeah. I know that she'll take care of three kids. I know that she's got everything covered because she is a guardian angel of mine. Hmm. So I go get my blood work done. And so f- every four weeks I get uh, uh, therapy, right? I get injected. Right. Small amount, but enough to make me tolerable. I have the gel. I do the, the androgen. Smart move. Yeah, yeah, smart. Hmm. And it made a big difference for me. Huge difference. Right? Yeah, I can yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I go to this place and it's this hole in the wall. And I'm like, man, I don't think I should be here because there's some people here that are scaring me. Mm-hmm. Right. And yeah. I can take care of myself. Not like you, but, you know, I'll stop. I, I, <laughs> you're a tough one. You are. <laughs> We're about as tough as nice, fresh baked rolls, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Exactly. That's right. It's all just visual perception. That's right, baby. Yeah. Bring it on. Oh, wait. Let me buy you supper first. Yes, please. (laughs) So I go in and I talk to an intake worker, and she's very nice, and she says, why aren't you on medicinal marijuana? Yeah. I'm like, why should I be? Mm -hmm. So we do the intake, and she says, this is what it's about. And I said, hmm, not sure that's for me. Right. So then... I talk to the psychiatrist and she says, she gives me the, the legit information on this. And I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. Not knowing that the Los Angeles Kings, several other professional hockey teams and major sports franchises use neurofeedback therapy prior to playoff time to get their players focused. Really? Yes. Hmm. Yeah. It is quite a renowned program in Kingston, Ontario. So what do you do? What's up? Like you get hooked up to you, something? You, yes, absolutely. You right. go in. Uh, when they first hooked me up, they said, well, there's no brain matter in there. What are we going to do? 
That could I be said, problem. there's gotta, <laughs> there's gotta be something in there. <laughs> so what they do is they take your original, they hook up electrodes onto your head, mm-hmm. and they get your original before your session brain wavelengths. Right. All right. Now I'm dumbing it down because to be honest with you, that's what I took in. So I'm just telling so you what I got. They're getting the baseline. Yeah, they're getting the baseline. And then once the baseline is done, they put on whatever kind of music they put, you put earplugs in. Right. Whatever kind of music you want to listen to. And they put a screen in front of you kind of with fancy kind of designs and graphics and all that stuff. You can close your eyes or you can watch the graphics. Right. But I selected spa music because I love spa really? music. That was your choice. Oh, so, yes, man. It's so relaxing to me. Wow. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm listening, and then I get scratches in my ears. And I'm like, there's got to be something wrong with these cheap headphones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm like... Air Canada headphones or something they're giving you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, the girl comes in. She's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, but there's a scratching in my ear. She said, oh, the girl didn't tell you? And I said, no. She said, that's supposed to happen when you're starting to process negative thoughts. What? Like, get out of here. And she said, liken it to this, Mr. Tripp. I'm like, it's Peter. <laughs> You're driving down a road, Sean. Yeah. It's 3 a.m. You've worked a 12-hour day. You've worked four hours of overtime. You start to drift to sleep. I worked at Calm Buddy. I had no overtime like that, remember? I get off, I get off on time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I had to say. It. All right. Sorry. Oh, that Sorry. is so true. <laughs> um, oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, but you worked harder than okay. we did most days. I'll stop. All right. Um, I know it's bullshit. So, <laughs> liken it to the uh, rumble strip on the side of the highway. Right. You're driving. You go to the left or you go to the right, and what wakes you up? A rumble strip. Well, this is what those scratches do. They keep the negative thoughts away. Unlike EMDR, Mm -hmm. where you kind of have to face it and kind of process it and turn it from a negative into a positive, I guess. And sometimes that can be very hard. And sometimes it can make people just stone-faced and non-emotional. And I'm, as you know, I'm not that kind of person. No, not at all. And I did six sessions. Say that ten times fast. Yeah, be careful. Six sessions, <laughs> and I the the difference was phenomenal. And I tried this one day. Uh, I said, "Okay, I'm going to go in the morning, and then in the afternoon, I'm going to play my father-in-law in golf, and I'm going to kick his ass because I'm going to be so focused." Hmm. That didn't work. <laughs> he still beat me. <laughs> But I can tell you, those negative thoughts were few and far between, and my brain was trained more to go away from that and to focus on positive. Hmm. And I haven't, I haven't done that in a long time. I haven't gone there, but my wife and I were just discussing this last week that it's time that I go back because we're starting to see the pattern reemerge. And I've been, you know, I've been, just not myself. I haven't been okay. the happy go lucky Pete. Right. Um, and and I've I've seen it, but I yeah, you know. Yeah. I just didn't want to go back there because I thought I was doing okay. However. Yeah. yeah. We almost like we don't learn. Like, we, we no. Just, we just uh, we don't want to go back because I'm fine. But even though we know it fixed us the first time. Absolutely. And, and it's, you know, no, it's no big deal to need some maintenance. And no, you're right. And and tell me if I'm wrong here. But for me, and what I know about paramedics and police officers hmm. and firefighters and maybe even some nurses, we are kind of a cracked society to begin with before we get into the business. I think so. I think yeah, we're a little bit off. You know, we're with. not your <laughs> yeah. yeah, we like yeah. what attracts us to want to be in a position that we're in. Yeah. It's not normal, Sean. It's not. And if you and if you go to these people that are super scholastic, book smart, they don't usually last long in paramedicine because they gotta use their hands. Hmm. And if you go to people that are 
you know, uh, are really good with their hands, they seem to flourish. Yeah. Because they can put two and two together. Okay, I can do this with my mind, my hands. I'm a tactile learner. Boom, I'm in. But we we are all a little cracked to begin with, and we're warped. I don't know. I I, <laughs> I want to say society's rejects, but we're not. I don't you know, know what you mean, mean, though. I totally know what you mean. I agree like, with you. It's hard. It's hard to put into words, and that's yeah. Like, yeah. So, so what was, was that called again? What was that therapy called again? You did. It's got neurofeedback therapy. That sounds. Um, it sounds really good now. I did EMDR and it worked for me. Like I did the yep. light bar, followed light back and forth. And yep. for me, it was like, yep. boom, done. Thank you very much. And I'm, and I'm good. <laughs> However, and it, you know, everybody's different, but I'm hearing that kind of therapy, what you were talking about sounds, sounds really good. Like I can see how that works. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it doesn't yeah. seem like you're punishing the person by putting them through it again. Like the no, you know, like not. the cognitive behavior modification yeah. stuff, like just um, which seems to me personally cruel, but does work yeah. for people. It also works for, for some sure. people too. But uh, yes. yeah, I really that's interesting. I really like the sounds of what you did. Yeah, and I, it, you know, it's uh, we're all covered under certain health plans, but if you're not, it's not that expensive. Really? Yeah, it's like sixty bucks, I think, for. 45 minutes, something hmm. like that. I don't think that that's a lot of money when I'm thinking about my mental health. No. And I've seen people go in there, Sean, who were like unable to sit down. Like, like we're talking not only PTSD, right. but other mental issues as well. And the success rate for this is sky high. I, I don't have the figures with me, yeah. but they're, they're all positive. Hmm. What now? Yeah. So after you did that, and obviously it was successful. So what did you notice at work and in your personal life that that allowed you to believe that you know what this, I am better, or it is better, or I'm dealing with things better? Uh, it was those calls that were triggers. Right. Those triggers, like those rapes, like those the traumas, the beatings, um, the burnings. Um, those things were, uh, I just did them and, and you were able to file them. Process, yes, but process them first. Right. Okay. This is how I felt. Why did I feel this way? Okay. This, this, this. Okay. Cool. Now that I feel that, how can I, how can I get rid of that? <laughs> my poor wife. That's my sounding board. Yeah. If I wasn't able to kind of process it 100%, then Lori was getting a text or a phone call. No matter what time it was, right? And she was always going to say, "Okay, how are we going to? How are we going to deal with this?" Hmm. And just hearing those words, Bud, yeah, how are we going to deal with this? Means that I'm not alone in this fight. Oh no, you're far from it. You know, yeah. Like, but still, take o- take away all of the outside stuff. Right. The amazing work that you're doing. The amazing work that I've got your back is doing. The amazing work that. Tema's doing, mm. and all of the other, Cali's Corner, all yeah. of these people are doing uh, across Canada and through the United States. Take that all away, Sean. Mm. And when someone beside you says, what are we going to do about that? Yeah. That's powerful shit, man. Yeah, I mean, that's your best friend. Absolutely. Right, that means something different. It absolutely, it gets you deep. You know, it gets into your brain to make you say, yeah, how are we going to do this? Because you feel stronger right away. Hmm. Right? Yeah. I what, do anyway. Oh, yeah, I, absolutely. Right? What do you, are the things that you do now or try to incorporate regularly into your life now, like to, for any, like, form of self-care or self-maintenance, have you had to do that? Yes. Um, one of the big things I do is I try to stay mentally sharp, first of all. I try I do to that. do uh, – <laughs> it's hard for me. It's smart like a banana. Are you just sitting there doing uh, what, Sudokus all day, or what are you doing? I'm not – dude, I'm not smart enough to do Sudoku. They break my brain. <laughs> I can spend like, they, they, 13 seconds on one, and that's about it. <laughs> and I'm, you know, Search I'm your done. words, buddy. The I'm giant done. ones. Yeah. Search your words. Yeah. <laughs> With yeah. words that are no longer than four four letters. <laughs> yeah. Done. Yeah. It's, it's – uh, what I do try to do is some type of medical research – through the day. Okay. Some, some, one article, 
I look for something that is new, something, and, and Facebook is good for that, for picking up a new yeah. article on 12 leads or a new article on, on something else. It just, and it, it takes me away. Right. Um, and then I, I'll watch a, a series, um, on my phone on Netflix. You know, it's just something there. And just little mental exercises that I learned through cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. Right. Where, okay, what did you do today? What happened? Did you process it? Are you okay with it? Is Are you not okay with it? Okay. Yeah. Let's put it in this basket. Let's file this for later on. Now let's deal with this. Because sometimes it can be, it can just all come at you at once if you don't deal with it. Right? Yeah. L- l- and l- communication. L- 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 oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. And just communicating that. Yeah. I'm going to hit you with a couple of things. Have you tried yoga? <laughs> um, five, five, 260 pounds. I, listen, dude, I know. I get you. <laughs> I know. Right? I'm 5'10", 270. You know? I understand. And, so, and no, uh, I haven't. Okay, here's the deal. you got to do okay. it. I, I'm gonna, I, I've heard you on your podcast talk about that. It's, it's horrific, and you don't want anybody to see it or watch you doing it. It's, it's, it's like a train wreck. It is. However... It is. I'm excited to see what you think. I'm going to send you. I'm not buying leotards. No, no, we don't. Don't go crazy. I'm just saying. uh, Yeah. I'm not getting in Lulu's. I know. I heard that (laughs) Jamie McWhorter wears Lululemon pants everywhere. He has like eight different pairs in different colors, and he loves them. (laughs) And I make fun of him for it, but anyway, he loves them. Listen, I'm going to listen. There's an app. They this app has nothing to do with the podcast and they don't they're not like a sponsor or anything like that but they they should be i know yeah that's true yeah shout out to yoga academy go to absolutely yoga academy app and you do these little like 15 minute there's a whole bunch of 15 you know you you can you can uh, shorten the time up as much as you want but they have ones for flexibility for strength and right from the beginner it has a little warm-up and it talks you through it with some night you'll like it because it's like spa music. So you're going to be in heaven. Oh, so, so, okay. and I'm telling you, it is hard to get through. Hard, okay. 15, 15 minutes of yoga for me is hard to get through because I'm not all that flexible. Yeah. I got, I got this stupid Santa belly that I, it makes it hard to do some stuff. Like, and then, <laughs> uh, I know, right? And all these other things. However, me too. However, yep. but I will say though, you do notice improvement pretty quickly if you stick with it, but okay. afterwards, afterwards, you feel amazing. It is, I was very surprised. I was shocked. All right. All and right. Big I'm, shout I'm out the again challenge. to Teresa Coulter. Look up Teresa Coulter. I don't, yep. you would know who she is from, from Sock Drawer Stories. Probably you've seen that. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. I never would have tried it. She sort of shamed me into it and bullied, <laughs> bullied me into it. So, but I love her for it and that's awesome. Okay. So, okay that's number Perfect. one. Number one, yoga. Yeah. Get on it. So okay. number two, have you floated yet? Have you been in a float? Uh, have no. you been in a float tank? I don't. Okay. I sink. No, no, you don't. I don't swim. You don't. You don't. So yeah, listen, I do. you, you know what the, you know about the black, the, uh, the black sea. Yes. Right. Okay. So. People go there from all over the world to, to just float in the sea. So, isn't that based on its sodium content? Yes. Yeah, so here's what you okay. here's what here's what you got, dude. You got a you got a pod that you get into with water that's skin temperature, so you don't feel it. It's okay. dark. You can have lights if you want, but it could be dark, so you have no visual inputs, and in quiet, so you have no auditory inputs. So it, okay. it's a sensory de- deprivation tank. And okay. And there's 1,100 pounds of Epsom salt in the water. Wow. So it's almost like a fine gel. Yeah, kind of, kind okay. Of, kind of like a, you know, anyway, you float. You cannot sink. You can't make yourself sink. You sit, Listen, I get in there for 90 <laughs> minutes, and I go to like, sleep. I go to sleep. How many minutes? 90, 9 zero. Wow. And I sleep, Peter. You go to sleep. You have a nap, uh, and I, you're fine. Yeah, but I'll need my CPAP machine. Uh, okay. That might cause an issue. Listen, no one's listening to you. You know, like you got to try this. Like it is. I, yeah, I will. I well, will. Listen, if you come back, I'm sure they have them there. But yep. if you come, whenever you come home, you need to tell me. Yep. Give me a heads up, and then I'm gonna set you up. I might actually go with you because this is gonna be hilarious. So <laughs> I will. <laughs> this is gonna be fun. You do videotape me. This is gonna be fun. So I'll set you up or us up at the Compass Rose Health and Wellness Center in Bedford. And okay. 
we're going to go for float. And you're going to Banana hammocks all around. Whatever you feel comfortable in, brother. <laughs> yeah. You're in there by yourself, so you go crazy. But the... Um, wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so try it. If, if you have it out okay. there, you should try one just because I think you yeah. like it. Now, I'm going to we'll tell you this. So I'm going to give you a heads up, though. If you do try it, the first yeah. time, because the Epsom salt brings out... It brings out a lot of toxins, so yes. the first time you do it, you're going to feel sick, maybe. Really okay. sick, maybe. And okay. what you have to do, that's just to tell yourself that's normal and power through it. Yep, yep. And then everything gets better. Because that, especially okay. initially, it's drawing out a lot of toxins. Sure. And afterwards, you feel amazing, your skin's amazing because of all the Epsom salt. And, yeah. but you're just 100% relaxed. It's, it's amazing. So we're gonna get, yeah, we'll get you hooked up when you get, when you come home. Yeah, absolutely. So those are two things I'd you have to try. That. Two things you have to try. I will. Yeah. So one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on, Peter, one of the many reasons, but what focused me on it is because, uh, you reached out and you asked some questions because you want to start telling your story and yes. you got a really cool idea, uh, about doing it on YouTube. Yeah. So yeah. What's up with that? I what are you do. doing? Um, thanks for mentioning that. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Uh, the, what the YouTube channel and page is going to be about is, is kind of my story, who we are as PTSD individuals, right. um, and that we're not rejects. And every day I'm going to give a little bit more into my life mm -hmm. to where I am today. And then we're going to give, uh, allow some feedback from people. Right. Uh, whether it be immediately or, you know, posting and, and whatnot. And the, there's going to be an open forum for discussion. There, there, I won't tolerate any negativity. Mm -hmm. Um, if anybody wants to be a dick, uh, they'll be removed <laughs> and they won't be allowed back in seriously within I reason. I, hear you. No, I, I, I understand we're going to get some haters and we're going to get people that are yep. just there to fuck around and be dicks. That's fine. Go yep. ahead, but yep. you'll be booted. Right. I got no time for that shit. No. I want to help people. Yeah. Uh, and I want to tell my story and show maybe 30 to 40 minutes a week. Show these people that you can do it. You can survive. Uh, if I get to adulthood with what I went through as a child. Yeah. Anybody can get through a normal childhood and get through anything as an adult. It doesn't have to be uh, in our field. It can be just in life, uh, right. and I want to be able to help those people. So, is that have you set up the channel yet? Uh, not yet. Uh, it's coming. Do you know what? Uh, do you already know what it's going to be called and everything? Um, I or not? I'm thinking. I'm I'm hoping uh, it's just going to be paramedic Pete. Of course. Uh, that'll be the the headline of it, and and from there, it's what I'd like to do is paramedic Pete's PTSD my way. That's a whole lot of P's in that. It's a really, I know, but it's a lot of alliteration. The, the purpose, I know, but the purpose is that my, I'm a paramedic, I'm Pete, but my PTSD is positive talk support determination. It's yep. not post traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. I want that taken away. Hmm. Because I want it to be about positivity. Yeah. I want it to be about talking and I want it to be about support and how I can support these people and how I can give them the resources that they might not be aware of hmm. to get support and then show them the, der the determination that you have, that I have, that we all have to have this label, for a lack of a better term. Yeah. And what are we still doing, man? We're fighting. Yeah. We're still actively working and we're fighting because this isn't going to get us. This isn't going to beat us. Hmm. You know what? You mentioned that, and I'm, I'm going to bring this up, even though it might be a sore point for you, but I'm going to bring it up anyway. Go ahead. Because one of the one of the like things that makes me the happiest when I think back of all the years I did this <laughs> was was riding, and I'm trying. I think it was I was in my car then, because I was going, I was running at comms, so I was going back and forth to work, and you had a radio show, Paramedic Pete. Yeah. Remember that short-lived radio four. stint that you did? <laughs> Yeah, and I remember yep. you giving talks on like asthma and when the weather was really hot, what to expect, and yeah, it which was wicked. I thought it was like, oh, here it was it like comes. ahead of oh. its time. I thought it was awesome. It yeah. was crazy good. Yeah. Now we, yeah, we all know that didn't last long and why it didn't. But yeah, 
it was wicked. It was one of my best, my f- fondest memories of you doing that because it was it was so you. It was like perfect. That's exactly what you should be doing. I remember that and you know, so well. And I did this up in Fort Mac for over a year and a half. I did Paramedic Pete with Jerry Neville. No, you did 93.3. Yes, I did. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Every morning, I would get up at 5 a.m. Yeah. I would be in his studio in Fort Mac hmm. uh, for 5.20, and we ran it for a year and a half. Really? And, yes. And believe it or not, one of the biggest moments of my life came when one of the guys on my site I was listening to the radio one day and, hmm. and Jerry had played me over again and he said, I said, man, I love that song. He said, Oh yeah, that's my buddy, Tay Bay. Uh, I don't know if you follow country music, mm-hmm. but Tay Bay is, uh, has uh, written for One Direction, for Garth okay. Brooks, for Counting Crows, for Lady Antebellum. Right. Um, and he actually found out that I was the medic Connor's work site and he sent me a video appreciating me and what I do for Connor and his people really? uh, from his home in Nashville. Wow. And then, and then when he went to Fort Mac, because I was doing the show with Jerry, I got to meet him, went backstage, saw him before the show, hung with him after the show, huh. VIP, because I had the show. I had people wow. coming up to me going, hey, are you that paramedic P? And I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, can we get your autograph? And I'm like, yeah. seriously? Uh, yeah, I guess so. That but, was awesome. I loved it when it was on. Me and Rick yeah, Campbell, I, I believe it was me and Rick Campbell driving yep. back and forth to work, and we <laughs> were listening to Paramedic Pete. It was good. It wasn't on very long here, but it was awesome. No. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, yeah, for And sure. I liked it, too. I really did. And I'm yeah. hoping that the channel can be that as well. Oh, I think it's going to be. I think right? it's going to blow up, and I'm going to do Thank whatever you. I can to help it. But so Thank when you. do you, what's your goal? What do you, do you have a goal time frame to have this up and going? <sighs> My my time frame right now, uh, as you know, I'm on the shelf. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, um, I would like to see it up and going within the next two weeks. Uh, yeah, within, that's reasonable. I think that's good. Yeah, with, within the next two weeks. And then the other aspect of, uh, of what's happening is, uh, is uh, you know, is trudging forward as well. Right. You've seen uh, a couple of my poems on Facebook. Yeah, I get through about half of them, and then i got to put it down. <laughs> Like why? Oh no, no, that came out wrong. Not not because no, no, I I know why, but yeah, I want you to tell me because they're because they're powerful. Like they're just the truth, and they're they're really raw, and I that's all I can get through. Okay, they're really good. Like you're awesome. Yeah. And, Thank you, I appreciate it. But yeah, you can tell like um, it comes yeah. from deep inside, right? It comes from yeah. a dark place. Yeah, like our dark place. Right? Yeah, and so I bite it off in little pieces, and then I eventually I'll get through the whole thing. And then, um, yeah, but it's awesome. They're good. I mean, awesome. no, it's very good. Like, so, okay, so we're going to get that up. When, as soon as you get that up, you're going to let me know because we'll pump that out as well. And then we'll I'll do. have, when it's up, I'll have the link on my website. And then how else can people reach out to you if they want to right now? Through social media, I have um, just my Facebook page. Right. Uh, it's P-Trip ACP Flight Medic. And then it's just my email is trip103, my last name, and then 103 at gmail.com. Right. And uh, I don't have the email, specific email or website set up completely yet for the, the YouTube channel because yeah. I want to incorporate a, a page with that as well. Okay. Uh, and then there's, uh, you know, there's the other thing that's about to happen too. So um, we're hoping that that uh, gets up and running shortly as well. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, I mean, uh, we'll definitely get all that out there, and anything that you obviously that you do, let us just update me, and I'll keep everybody else updated. You're gonna, it's going to be awesome. You're going to be awesome. I have zero concerns you. whatsoever, you know, about you doing it. Like, it's just going to be good. Peter, if there's someone listening to this right now that's struggling, what would you say to them? First of all, I'd say... Get a hold of me on Facebook. Mm. Email me. I would give you my cell phone number. You know it, Sean. Yeah. And uh, I would give it to somebody. The biggest thing is everybody always says you're not alone. Uh, there's resources out there. Mm-hmm. That's all fine and good. 
but you have to be real with these people. I know you're hurting. One of the main things is to not solve their problem. Listen to them. Let them voice it. Yeah. Let them talk. Hear them. And I don't mean hear them in a sense like wah, 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 wah. Mm. Hear them. Yeah. Give mm. them some feedback when they need it. Don't tell them what they should hear. Don't tell them, what, sorry, what they want to hear. Tell right. them what they should hear. Right? Yeah. And I'm here. I am accessible 24-7. If I'm not, it's because I'm in the air. Cell phones don't get me in the air. And mm. that segues me to this, Sean. Yeah, what's up? And I, and I thank you for asking that question because what I'm also working on is my presentation to become a public speaker. Yeah, absolutely. And part of the goal is to hit nursing students, paramedic students. Yeah, I hear you. Firefighting students, military, young military personnel, corrections we need, we need officer to have a tour. students. We need to start a, like a EMS first responder school tour. Yes, go around. absolutely. That's what I want because it's not when these people are going to get it. Right. They are. That's right. What do we do before they get it, Sean? Yeah. Right? We teach them what to look for, how to respond, how to debrief, give them some feedback on us, give them some history, right? Get them to start thinking about being positive, yeah. talking, being supportive, mm. and then being determined not to let this kick our ass. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to say right now, and I know you're listening, Tara Vazel. Peter, we need to, we, we need to get Tara to bring you into that breaking barriers third, the third session next year. Absolutely. Like, that would Absolutely. be awesome. I have, I have three bookings. You have three bookings already? already? And I haven't even done my first presentation. You already have, you have Dalhousie, beat already. Dalhousie nursing students. Nice. Already. And that's a shout out to Shauna Ernst. Yeah. Who, uh, is doing that. And then I got, um, Brent Nicholson at Holland College. Anytime I have my program up, he'll peruse it and then he'll give me the okay. Yeah, he said the same thing to me too. We should go there. I want to go there with yes, you. Yes, absolutely. I'm a Holland yes. College alumni. I, well, let's go. Yeah, man. We're in like Flynn. Yeah. But to get back to your original question, yeah. I know it's frustrating. I know that you're hurting. And I know that you're feeling a lot of pain. I feel pain every day, and I'm not minimizing yours or this individual's. Yeah. I just want them to know that we can get through it. I'm not saying you can. We can, because I want to be their we. Yeah. I want to be their best friend. I want to be their uh, PTSD dog. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I want to be that someone that they can say, you know what? Uh, every door that I'm knocking on is being closed. But see that fucking door right down there? Hmm. That one that says Paramedic Pete on it? I know that fucker's got my back. Yeah. That's what I want people to know. Hmm. Well said, brother. This has been awesome. I, Sean, I can't thank you enough, man. <laughs> no, I'm serious, buddy. I, I'm serious. I can't. Um, oh, no I, I love you with all my heart, man. I, I really, you, truly do. And, um, you know, you're yeah. doing amazing things. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's a struggle. I struggle. But, I know. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, Peter, this has been, this has been awesome. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. This is going to be a great episode for so many people to hear. Yeah. Not because of me. I not hope so. But because of you. But, uh, <laughs> just want to make that clear. But thank you for taking the time. And again, I tell you, if anything that you ever need help with, just say the word, and uh would love to meet up with you sometime at an event. Um, yes, yes. That would be awesome. Yes. And then, uh but, you know, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it's going to happen. I know it's going to happen for you. And, uh, oh, it will. Yeah, it will. But, you know, until then, until we see each other and uh I get to talk to you again, please, you know, take care of yourself and take care of your family. And, you know, I love you. I will do, buddy. I love you, too. And I want you to know that if you need me, 
I'm I will. always <laughs> right beside you. I'm serious. No, I know. You know that. I know. I'm right beside you, brother. One thing I can always say, Peter, is that one thing I remember is that every time I see, I used to see you anywhere I saw you, mostly at the queue early in my career, is I always smiled when I saw you. Like, it was, I was happy when I got to talk to you. And, it's awesome, man. You know, because we always, do, we would joke with one another and everything was yep. cool and it was just like a sigh. It was like a, just, okay, good. Now I can go back. And, and you, know, you know why that is? Why is that? Mutual respect, my friend. Oh, for sure. I've, I I've looked up to you. you for a long time. I always looked up to you as a medic and, oh, and, uh, always have. You're going to make me cry, dude. Oh, you know what, dude? I just watched Dancing with the Stars, most memorable <laughs> year episode. And if you want to cry for a straight hour, that's what you have to do. Just watch that. It was, it's pretty draining. <laughs> you know what my, you know what my drainer is? What's that? The voice, America's Got oh, Talent. Yeah, Davison's all of these big stories. on the voice too. Kevin Davison, like I think he, yeah, gets all emotional with the yeah. voice. Oh, my yeah. wife says, "Really? You're <laughs> crying at a, at a commercial?" <laughs> yeah, I know. I cry all the time. It's so <laughs> ridiculous. But yeah, I know. Thanks, man. Listen. Thank you. Hopefully, it won't be long till I see you. Can't wait till I do. But thanks again for doing this. Thanks, buddy. I really appreciate your time and everything that you do. No, oh, my pleasure. Seriously. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And there you have it. Another episode has come and gone. Big thanks to Peter for coming on, and that was uh, a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Really powerful. So thank you for that. Thanks to the sponsors. You can check them out on the website, uptalkpodcast.com. Also, don't forget that event I told you about for Paramedic Nat. Check that out. I struggle too. I need you to know that. I do. If, you, if you're struggling right now and listening to this, I struggle too. And like Peter said, we can get through this. And we will. I am absolutely sure of that. Hope to have another episode out soon. I have lots of guests that have been waiting patiently to come on. So that is not an issue whatsoever. It's just getting them done. So... Time to uh, time to pump some out, and I will update you as soon as I have anything to tell you. Until then, go try some yoga. If you can get to a float center, get to a float tank, do some floating. Take care of yourself and your family. More love, less judgment. Cause we ain't superheroes, we're just all Trying to make a difference And the first on every scene And it's a heavy, heavy burden To carry all this hurting When you can't unsee The things you've seen It keeps going on When those sirens are gone Those sirens are gone.